going to talk about the coherent supernova. Thanks. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about Prokop supernova, um, particularly about black holes and neutrinos and how they relate. Um, so I'll briefly discuss some supernova theory, so type ones. Type one A's, which I want to talk about for a little bit, but then type twos and type one B's and C's, these are all core pop supernova. I'll talk about the status of core pop supernova theory um, and, and the basics behind core pop supernova theory. I'll then talk about black hole formation uh, in, in failed core pop supernova, and so predictions of populations. And also um, investigating if collecting neutrino oscillations, which I'll explain what they are, uh, can influence the explosion of this. So stop me if you have any questions, please. Um, thermonuclear supernova, these are type 1A supernova, are caused when you have something like a white dwarf-like object. Uh, we're not exactly sure what the pre-denner system is, but something like a white dwarf. Uh, thermonuclear explodes, completely obliterating the object, uh, releasing something like 10 to 51 Hertz. A lot of that is in optical. These are some of the brightest things you can see. <coughs> uh, that's used cosmologically as standard candles. So since we know they're the empirically how their luminosity, uh, we can predict their luminosity based on what they look like. Um, and this gives us a distance in here. A Korkoff supernova, which are classified as type 2, type 1B, and type 1C, is something completely different. So the only thing similar is they're called supernova, and they have similar energies in, in the optical, which is why they're associated with each other. This results from the collapse of an iron core in an evolved massive star. So any star of more than 8 to 10 solar masses will end its life with an iron core, which will eventually collapse um, and give rise to a core collapse or fail. The collapse, you can calculate if you take something like a white dwarf one and one and a half solar masses, collapse it to a neutron star, and you get 10 to 53 orders of energy. Initially, this is all thermal, and it gets all of its radiated as neutrinos. Most of it gets radiated as neutrinos. And there's only about 1%, which is something like 10 to 51 left um, for, the, for everything else in, uh, involved in the supernova. So mostly, that's kinetic energy of the ejecta. Some is, some is optical emission that we see in the sky. Uh, what you're left with is a neutron star in some cases, or if you have a failed core cross event, then you're left with a core core. Uh, type, so type 1 means there's no hydrogen observed in the spectrum. When you look at it, type 2 means there is hydrogen. The difference between type 1b and c, which are core cross and type 1a, is here you don't see any silicon lines in the spectrum, which distinguish it from the uh, nuclear uh, and the difference between 1B and C is, in C, you don't see any helium. In addition to not seeing any hydrogen, you don't see any helium. Type 1B specifically. I'm going to just talk about the more. Um, so this is what a massive star looks like at the end of its life. Uh, often you, you your reference to an onion skin like structure in a star. That's basically what this is. This is the uh, mass fraction of, of 21 different elements versus the enclosed mass. So this is the core down here, the inner two solar masses. And this star, which initially was 25 solar masses, uh, at the end of its life is only 15 solar masses. And that's it here at this end. So you have four solar masses of some helium hydrogen mixture sitting on the surface. And you have a helium shell an oxygen shell, and then there's a little bit of silicon in here, um, and then two solar mass out of the pool. So there's a 25 solar mass star with solar metallicity. It takes seven and a half million years to, from when it starts burning until when it gets to the core collapse stage. There's a radius of 1,500 solar radii and 3,200 Kelvin, so this is a, a red supergiant planet core collapses. This is made with the MESA code, which is an open source our evolution software, so you can download and evolve massive stars yourself if you want to. So you have this iron core, and that particular model is somewhere 1.8 or 2 solar masses. 
Uh, it's initially held up when it's when it's first made and, and throughout the rest of the star's evolution held up by electron degeneracy pressure from the electrons. So you're not actually burning the iron because there's nothing to go to that will give you uh, energy which would, which would hold it up. Rather, it's held up by the degeneracy pressure of the electrons. But uh, the same thing happens with white dwarf. You get too massive and then electron degeneracy pressure can no longer sustain you against gravitational flux. So at some point, Depending on the depending on the electron fraction of the core and also on the temperature of the core, there's some mass at which it'll start to collapse. It can no longer be all that. Um, it collapse continues all the way from densities around 10 to the 9, all over 10 to the 10, all the way up to nuclear densities, so 10 to the 14 grams per um, So this is a movie of that of that phase um, and a little bit after. So the density is rising in the core. This is radial velocity on the other side. So the, um, what you saw at the beginning was the core has some negative radial velocity in, in, in the column. When you get to nuclear densities, the equation of state stiffens, and you can no longer, now you have basically the force of neutron, neutron interaction, or nuclear nucleon interaction to, to hold up the neutron state. And so it stops collapsing, you get, a sh you get a shock wave where you have supersonically falling material hitting the surface of this part of neutron star. And it um, basically slows down to something below the center speed. So you get a shock, and the shock initially um, propagates out in the cell plate up here. So here's this, the outer edge of the iron core collapsing. Those jumps are just scale changes in the lab. So when you have your stock shawling, the stuff that's falling in is falling in something like 20% of the speed of light, and basically gets brought back down to zero velocity when you shock. So this, uh, the, the shocking of the material, in, in falling you have stuff like iron and silicon in falling. Um, inside the shock you have just pure neutrons and protons because it's really hot. So the shock, what it does is it breaks up the iron nuclei into and that takes a lot of energy, so roughly 8 MeV per nucleon, which for an iron nucleus is something huge, it's a couple hundred MeV, which is a lot of energy. Uh, so that, that, what, that, that region, but also since this region behind the shock is so hot, it's emitting lots of thermal neutrinos, so electron positron annihilation to neutrino and to neutrino. So those two things together um, soften the equation of state behind the shock. So basically reduce the thermal pressure by emitting energy as neutrinos and breaking up those iron nuclei. And that uh, basically causes this shock to stop. So it removes the energy behind the shock and causes the pressure to basically become equal to the ram pressure when the shock stops. This happens robustly in core clock supernova simulations that the shock stops. And uh, in 2D and in 3D as well. Um, there's some mechanism that will re-energize the shock and cause a supernova explosion, which we're not sure of yet. Um, in 2D, we can get explosions in some rare cases. So in very low solar, uh, lower accretion rate models, <coughs> oxygen, the and magnesium cores, um, or 10 solar mass, 11 solar mass stars, we can get explosions in 2D robustly, or maybe a little lower energy than we would like. Uh, but they do not occur in, in your standard variety, 15 cylinders. In 3D, there's not really any long-term simulations yet that are, have accurate enough microphysics to be able to tell us whether things happen or not in 3D. I'll get to talk more about that at the end. There's many ways people can imagine re-energizing the shock, however. So the, most, the one I like the best is the neutrino mechanism. And I'll describe it more in, in a second. Uh, why, why I like it is because it occurs in any any supernova simulation you do. So it, it always occurs. It just happens, <coughs> at least in one and two, to not be robust enough to explode the star. But that's unfortunate, but at least it occurs. So these other guys either require special conditions, so very high rotation, for example, um, or phase transitions, something like this. Um, so while they are robust and they do explode the star, they're not necessarily clear that it's going to happen for your current variety of stuff. 
And there's hydrodynamic instabilities in 2 and in 3D, so 2D, for example, uh, standing accretion shock instability, so you get oscillations of the shock in 2D. But, but again, these don't seem robust enough to explode the sky well, But they always occur in 2D. It's unclear whether they'll happen in 3D or what other 3D instabilities might show up. Last year, we could just be missing something completely. So there could be some physics that isn't included at all. It could just pull up stars even in one. Yeah, well, one of the issues with the computer view is, of course, that you um, have potentially a good work as a large scale. Yeah, so the, the nature and, of these is And whether, you know, whether this 2D size really represents the linear instability that's been claimed uh, based on some other simplified models is, I think, not entirely clear. You could, for example, source or history and um, uh, the production of mushrooms and just the community themselves and then you just throw it up. So this is just a, yeah, a little more about each of these ones that I kind of glossed over. So the magneto rotational mechanism, it's where you have differential rotation in your protein front star, and this um, can lead to uh, growth of the magnetic field via the MRI. Um, so this was done way back. They were originally proposed by that. But you need lots of rotation in order to get a large enough magnetic field that you can draw it into. Well, the other issue uh, is that and those calculations, I mean, it's even ones, I think, pretty much all. I put in a quite substantial coil in that field, and then it's wound up. And what is not yet been demonstrated in that type of situation, you start with a strong rotation this year. If you have a weak coil in that field, then you can still make it. Yeah, the, the MRI is a very hard thing to see. Uh, so, phase transition induced explosions. Uh, basically, you can have some uh, QC phase transition where your nucleonic matter transitions to quark matter. And so, for this particular model, uh, their phase transition basically triggers a collapse in the neutron star uh, to quark matter. So, this softens the equation of state, and just like the iron core collapses, the neutron star collapses. In the and then it stiffens again once you get, once you get uh, to the quark equation. Uh, and then you get another sh shock that's launched, and this propagates out and is enough to re-energize the original shock, the positive explosion. This is a this is a fine-tuned equation of state in order to achieve this that. So again, it's unclear whether or not this space transition even exists, or if it exists with the right parameters to lead to this. This this one is not more than two solar masses. The, the equation of state that does this is not more. Than So you would have to have a maximum mass greater than two to begin with. And then the question is, can you still get this? You could have, uh, this is one proposed mechanism for our profile to promote a shock rebuttal mechanism, so an acoustic mechanism. Here you have the poor neutron star oscillating really rapidly, um, creating pressure waves that steepen the shocks and again re-energize re re that shock. But again, this is unclear whether or not it's exists in uh, any star. So whether it's numerical, I mean numerical artifact, whether it's simulations, um, or something that actually exists. The neutrino mechanism, as I said, does not rely on extraordinary conditions like fast rotation, um, but instead just on regular neutrino interactions in the post-shock region. So this is a plot of the energy deposition versus radius for neutrinos, or energy emission rate. Uh, here you have uh, negative energy. This means that the matter is emitting neutrinos and cooling down. So the blue is a net cooling due to neutrinos. Uh, but there comes a radius when all these neutrinos that are emitted down here are propagating out in radius and will interact with the material out here. And it happens that there's the material is emitting less neutrinos than it's absorbing from the background neutrinos. 
And so you get a net heating of the material. So the internal energy of the material is increasing due to these neutrino interactions. So this red region is called the gain region, and we're going to refer to it a whole bunch of them. And if this has enough heating in it, then you can increase basically the pressure behind the shock and re-energize it and cause it to explode. So where's the shock on that diagram? The shock is right here. This heating is from something called the gain radius to the shock, um, and it's just due to neutrino capture on free protons and neutrons. Right. There's no heating on the other side of the shock because it's just less dense. Than yeah. Right. yeah, there's a huge density drop here, so those things. And you also have, you don't have free neutrons or protons, you just have heavy nuclear that. Which in principle you could capture on them. So, yeah, so if you, by one of these mechanisms, manage to explore your star, you'll have a core clock supernova in the sky, you'll have a remnant, possibly, most likely a neutron star, if you explode and with, with something like 1.4 solar masses. You could have um, material fall back onto the proto neutron star in late times, because it doesn't all get unbound by the supernova explosion, and possibly make a black hole. So it's one mechanism why like how you can make a black hole. Um, the other way you can make a black hole is just if you fail to re-energize your shock at all, you recruit enough material onto the proton front star that it collapses to a black hole very soon after bounce, so within a second after bounce. In the case where you have absolutely no rotation, everything will just accrete on to the black hole. You'll probably have some rotation, even if you have a little bit of rotation very far out, it's not going to be able to accrete. And so you'll form, likely form a disk of some, of some type. If you have the correct distribution of angular momentum, then maybe you can form a disk uh, that might lead to a gamma burst. So there's many steps in between here from getting from this to an actual gamma burst. But this is, this is the route you might take. OK, so I'm going to show you some select observations of quark clock supernova. So select in the sense that I'm interested in black holes from failed supernova, so there's a bit bias. Um, so SMART et al. in 2009 uh, did a, a survey of, of type 2p quark clock supernova. So these are stars that have uh, lots of hydrogen in type 2. P means plateau, so it means that the light curve levels out for a long time. This means basically you have a big hydrogen envelope. Their results show that there is a maximum mass in type 2 pieces for cloud supernova of 16 and a half solar mass plus So this is their data here, upper limits, but also actual measurements of progenitor stars from archival data. Uh, they measure 20. Uh, in reality, we see red supergiants all the way up to 25 solar masses. And so what what is the discrepancy here? Um, it's about two sigma, so they would should have seen if they measured 20 stars with an IMF from roughly eight solar masses all the way up to 25, they should have seen four stars more than 16 and a half solar masses out of 20, but they didn't see it. So they claim this is a problem, uh, that there's no type 2 piece supernova above 16 and a half solar masses. Um, um, another recent study looked at comparing the star formation rate uh, in galaxies up to redshift one to the supernova rate. Uh, the supernova rate is something like a factor of two smaller than the, sorry, this is not the star formation rate, this is the, the supernova rate predicted from the star formation rate. So assuming some stars will eventually explode. Uh, and they find that there's a factor of two less supernovas than we would predict from the star formation rate. So there's lots of uncertainty in here. There could be uncertainty in the actual star formation rate. Uh, they, one suggestion they say is we just don't see a lot of the supernova. It should be happening. So they're low luminosity or make black hole or a combination of the two. So this factor of two is probably not all black holes. And probably not 50% of your stars aren't making black holes. Um, but it could be just 
combination of that and low luminosity superior, but you're not seeing all the way up to our chip one. Finally, we definitely know that black holes exist. Um, this is a um, mass distribution of black hole masses from 20 or so observations. Uh, they peak around eight solar masses as a width that's a two or three solar masses. So we see five and 10 solar masses where lots of black holes are observed. There's lots of more massive black holes. There's 15 solar masses and 20 solar mass black holes. Um, so, um, so there's some what is the total number? Or what is it um, decided that there is a, a black hole that is uh, in the So this is a little bit of a, a likelihood. Yeah. Lot, so it doesn't have any very number. No. It, that's hard to, I don't know if we have enough observations for that yet. To be able to predict from. No, it's not a prediction. It's just, uh, oh, I see. So this one. Is basically given what has been observed. Yeah. Yeah. The mass, but it, well, how many have been observed? Something like 20. I think there's 20 that go into this plot. Okay. This is the first. Yeah. They they take each one and put a Gaussian on it and yeah. uh, they do lots of stuff. Uh, also interesting though is that there's there's apparently none below five solar masses, which is called a black hole mass, which is can also be something. Okay, so now I'll talk about some of our results. We use uh, GR1D. It's a it's a open source, uh, spherically symmetric GR or and hydrodynamics code, and it's useful for studying exactly this. So stellar collapse, proton neutron star formation, early evolution, black hole formation, um, and some other things that, that you want know there. That includes finite temperature equations of state. So uh, um, accurate treatment of the, as accurate as you can get treatment of the neutrino physics, uh, sorry, of the, of the nuclear physics. The neutrino physics is very approximate, um, just so basically we can uh, do lots of simulations in a short amount of time. You can include rotation in a spherically symmetric way. Um, this is the, from GR1D in blue, and uh, simulation of the same equation of state and the same progenitor. Uh, also in 1D, but with full radiation uh, neutrino transport, Boltzmann neutrino transport, shown in red. And so GR1D reproduces the delectinization first, but also the luminosity is within 20%, and black hole formation times also within roughly 20%. So if this neutrino leakage does not have a job at uh, capturing all the physics, some of the physics that's going on. Is it in that? In one sense, I mean, like, the, like like a mesh. You know, that if you were randomly choosing, you would choose a non-neutron or a non-neutron code unless it's a mass that they are code, then that's fine because if you're basically yeah. using a group of words and non I mean, what I'm saying is that it's a great group of Yeah, so no, it's not. It's it's fixed grid. Um, it, um, for core pops, and initially, you're at very low density, so you don't need to degrip, but the clock space happens very quickly, so it doesn't really matter. In 1D, if you have a very, you have 200 meter resolution, um, but you're dealing with something that's a thousand kilometers big, it doesn't really make a difference. You just have way more resolution than you need. About a thousand over from, from the origin up to tens of thousands of kilometers logarithmic space. Some special considerations for the proto-neutron star, because we do actually form black holes which are very compact, or almost form black holes, then you need lots of resolution for the short distances. But in 1D, it's fine. You just, you just throw computational power out of it. It's so if you do the fill, it's worth it, so you're not going to have the clutch at all the the surface of the star, like you yeah. be successful. Yeah, the density gradients aren't so, aren't so large. Um, this is a typical uh, evolution of a collapsing star. So this is the collapse phase down here. These are mass shells shown in the lines. The red dashed lines are half solar mass increments. Uh, so the matter falls in, you form your shock, which is shown in blue. The shock propagates out, it stalls, and then just slowly accretes in and eventually forms a black hole. This is, this is zoomed into the last millisecond. You can see the 
um, at the very, very late times, the stuff is collapsing into a block. So with the gauge we choose, we can't actually have a block hole, um, but we can get arbitrarily close to it. And so for, I, I really only care that it forms, you know, about like 400 milliseconds on your back, so I don't care if it's last couple of microseconds. Uh, interesting to point out, so all this material, and I said this before, is supersonically inflowing. So no information can come from down here, travel back up through the inflowing material. So the only thing that affects the evolution of these mash shells up here is the enclosed mass. So that's only a, basically yeah, an enclosed gravitational mass. And so all this fancy 3D stuff, for example, um, lots of turbulence down here, convective stuff, um, it's not going to affect the accretion rate from this uh, mass shell right here. So it's only going to depend on the total gravitational mass. The only thing that it will depend on is basically how many neutrinos we lose because they carry away gravitational mass. They carry away energy. What's your answer? What's your zero temperature maximum mass? Uh, for this particular star, for this equation of state, yeah. um, uh, gra gravitationally it's 1.7. Okay, so you're getting Lots of probably idealistic. Fast one point seven is the low side. Yes, yeah. There's there's um I mean, it doesn't change the principle of the calculation in any respect. Yeah. We try not to use this equation of state anymore. So um, my later results don't use this equation state. But you still get uh, the, the the next highest up one, the next highest maximum mass, still forms black holes fairly soon. So your accretion rate is dropping like a rock. So most of this m m mass, like this is two solar masses, was accreted in 150 solar, uh, 150 masses. And so your accretion rate is slowing down dramatically. So even if, if you require, say, 2.4 solar masses to, well. I thought that the argument goes yeah, out this, right? It does, it does. So you need three solar masses or close to three solar masses, then it could take some time. Yeah, yeah, so for the, for the next highest equation state, you don't need much more than this, maybe a tenth of this. Which would happen in. But it could be 0.4 solar masses, or you know, multiple or multiple by 1.3 solar masses. Yeah. yeah. 0.5 yeah. solar masses. I will have a plot, of, a plot that will tell you all that. So this is another movie now, the same movie, but not stopping at the stalling phase, but going all the way to black hole formation phase. So your accretion shock will continue to accrete material, decrease in radius, now the speed's getting much higher. Eventually, your neutron star, your four neutron star, become gravitationally unstable and start to just like the iron core. So these are uh, all the models we use in our study for black hole formation. Um, models that have low metallicity or no mass loss included. So these are sorry, these are stellar evolution models from zero age main sequence all the way up to four clocks. Uh, so most of the models here I plot the pre supernova mass versus the original mass. The models that have no mass loss or really low metallicity have, at the end of their life, the same mass as they started with, because they didn't lose any mass. Um, for solar metallicity stars, which are all the rest of these guys, they lose a lot of mass during their life. And so, for example, this 120 solar mass guy loses 95 or more percent of its mass and ends up with five to six solar masses. Very sen the point of this plot is, is to say it's very sensitive to the mass loss description you use. If you reduce your mass loss by a factor of two, so the difference between this purple curve down here and this cyan curve here, there's a whole variety of mass loss rate of difference of a factor of two. So you get a huge difference in the pre supernova structure by just changing your mass loss by a factor of two. So the, one of the largest uncertainties in, in supernova structure for massive stars is mass loss. And in cell revolution in general, I think mass loss is one of the biggest things. Uh, so for two of these model sets, the solar metallicity model set in blue and have one of the, the low metallicity model sets, which is that pre-supernova mass equals zero to the of mass. Uh, I show the time it takes to form a black hole versus zero to the this equation of state has a maximum mass above two solar masses. Um, and 
you can see that it's very complicated. So the time it takes to form a black hole is not something you can easily parameterize in terms of the zero to the sequence mass. Uh, for these stars around 25 solar masses, you can form a black hole within one second, but then you just go up to 30 solar masses or 28 solar masses and you're taking three seconds to form a black hole. And then you go to 40 solar masses and you're forming black holes very quickly again, and then depending on your mass loss prescription, you get <coughs> And the reason why this is so complicated is because you're comparing something that depends on the basically inner few solar masses of a star at the end of its life, and you're comparing it to something at the start of its evolution, which is its original mass. And things are, obviously they're related because these are the initial conditions. There's lots of stuff that goes in to mapping the series and its mass to a final structure of the star. If you use the carbon oxygen core, you uh, So that would fix that would fix this part, but it wouldn't it wouldn't fix this. Why is that? This so this is um, this little dip down here at 25 solar masses is purely due to advanced burning differences in advanced burning. Oh, okay. I see. Okay, so that's yeah. that all of you, but that's not. I mean, that's basically uh, no, you didn't say that the burning uh, depends on the uh, a lot of the mass of the star. Um, so the it depends on the carbon oxygen to core mass, presumably non monotonic So if I was to plot the carbon oxygen core mass, it would increase as you increase in zero grain sequence mass, but it would smoothly go through this complete region. You wouldn't even notice any difference. But yeah, in the in the inner core, in the iron core. In the silicon shell, the structure is very different. But I still don't get the reason for that being so different. I don't understand it either. I tried to understand it. No, but it's just people who've done simulations with different results. Not like but this is this is one model set. Yeah. This is all. So this red curve is. And they're finding non-monotonicity in this yeah. That could be partly, maybe because of the shift towards the more oxygen. But then it goes back down. No, probably. So if, then it goes back up. So at 25 solar masses, what's the total mass in iron and silicon? Um, uh, I don't know. We can on that plot I showed you. There was roughly two solar masses of iron, and then. The next shell out was purely oxygen, but half of it's so maybe two points out. But this rapid rise at 25 or so yeah. has something to do with the fact that that total mass in the iron silicon is varying around your class mass, and you have to start bringing in the carbon and oxygen. Well, yeah, no, you're right. So the, the guys that form black holes quicker have bigger iron cores. Yeah. And, and basically, more mass in the small radius. And that's why they make a black hole quicker. They will creep the mass quicker. Are you saying you have more than two solar masses in the iron by itself? Sometimes, in some models, yeah, you can get them to two solar masses iron cores. They're very long to tell you. Roughly long to tell Yeah. So this, this discussion will continue over the next few slides. Um, this, this parameter is, the, is equal to two and a half solar masses divided by the radius that encloses two and a half solar masses. So models that have large iron cores have lots of mass at small radii. And so this number is very big, because our 2.5 is small. So that's like models like this black line, which is a 40 solar mass star. Two and a half solar mass is at a, is at a radius of 5,000 kilometers. So this number is something like a half, 26. For a 120 solar mass star, you have to go all the way up to 15,000 kilometers before you get two and a half solar masses. This is just due to the structure of the star at Pollux. So there's a different iron core structure and a different shell structure. So its, it's XZ is, is, is much smaller because its 2.5 radius is, is much larger. Two, I picked 2.5 because that's roughly the maximum mass of equations of state. So it's roughly the mass scale for black hole. 
make sure I understand that you get, these are taking other people's yeah. cell revolution model. Yeah, this is the pre season model. Yeah. So if I plot my confirmation time, this is this parameter, things are much nicer. So here I'm actually applying black confirmation time to something that comes right from the pre-supernova structure, not doesn't involve all that stellar evolution operations. And so it's much nicer. Um, progenitors that have a high C C2.5 is a big iron core, large accretion rates, doesn't take very long for that mass to get to the center, and you can form a black hole very quickly. And then as this parameter gets smaller, it takes longer and longer to form a black hole. This uh, dash curve is just showing that basically this is just following the free fall time of where that 2.5 solar mass element is, how, how long does it take the free fall to the core, that's basically the time it takes to form a rock. Okay, but not, I mean, if you, this, this guy isn't going to make a black hole, it's going to explode. It's, it's going to explode, most likely, because we know stars explode all the time, so it's going to explode in like half a second or something. It's going to make 1.4 solar So most of these guys will explode. Um, but we know some of them will make black holes, because we see black holes. So it's a very interesting question to ask which of these are more likely to form black holes and which are less likely to form black holes. And in investigating this, maybe you can discover something about the neutrino mechanism. How, how does it depend on the pre supernova structure? So we take a whole bunch of models, we <coughs> artificially increase the amount of neutrino heat so that if you remember the red region in that plot I showed you, which was the, the gain region, we increase the amount of, artificially increase the amount of heat in there and this eventually drives into scope. So this number over here is like a fudge factor. As you increase the fudge factor, you're increasing the neutrino heat and eventually you launch explosions. Is that difficult? That's 50% if you are wrong by 50%, everything would explode for it. Um, so this bomber is sort of very possibly borderline but anyway. Um, so, what do you mean wrong by 50%? Well, I mean, I'm saying if neutrino absorption lasts 50% more efficient than everybody thinks, would then everything explode? Is it, does, oh, um, or is, it, is this a case where it's hard it's to only 50% and it works, but in other cases it's not so? Yeah, so I, that'll, kind of, that'll be the next slide. Oh, okay, sorry. But it's hard to, especially in a complex system like a supernova, it's hard to say, I'm going to increase something by this percentage. You, sh you will never expect your result to change by the same time. It's, it's, there's no, 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 I'm just wondering. If it, if, I'm surprised at how close it is. Yeah, well, this is, yeah, this is, um, yeah. 30% 30, 30 here to increase So what uh, are the processes that are included in the data? It's just char charge current capture of neutrinos on neutrons and photons in the gain region. And a low That includes muon and tau No. Well, but that's the gain region. Um, no, they don't have any charge current reactions. Oh, it has to be charge current. Well, the heating no. is the charge current. So the, the, the leakage scheme takes no, care of it. Really. What, I guess what he's asking is about the electron scattering. What contribution actually does that make higher? Like you know, new end into new end. Um, yeah, so we don't include any complicated processes. And then there's also a new new or new new bar into E plus E minus there was. And the thing is, uh, if you take it to the absurd limit, actually those are the ones that are responsible so, you know, eventually they have to become important, and the fact that they might include it is surely possible. Uh, some people include them, right? I think Yankta includes neutrino neutrino annihilation. I don't think um, it's not a, in this fact that it's not a significant. Yeah, I think if it was, then then he would be making a bigger deal of it, I mean, <laughs> and making everyone else do it. But is it accurate? Because uh, the, the muon neutrinos have a different spectrum. Yeah. And so what that means is that it's a big Yeah. If you take that reaction into account, then it would 
if, if, you, if you did include that interaction in your transport. Which you're saying Yelp yeah, does. I'm pretty sure he, he includes neutrino neutrino interactions at, at, uh, going into E. I think the E, e, e minus E plus and also new E, new E R as well. Which then you, you're right, then you get a higher energy. But this is just purely, I mean, in essence, it's electron luminosity times mean squared energy of electron neutrinos times column density of the nuclei. And the same for anti neutrinos. And then I just increase it by some number. So this is not the factor I increase it by, but something that's made it a little more physical. It is the integrated amount of net heating in the red region divided by the integrated net cooling in the blue region. And this gives some efficiency. Basically, how much energy, neutrino energy, do you have to inject back into the material in order to get an explosion? And I plot it versus the same parameter, the 62.5. And so there's lots of scatter, um, but roughly stars with small iron cores, smaller region rates, your typical 10 to, uh, 15 solar mass stars all fall in this region down here, and be roughly somewhere on average like 16% uh, heating efficiency to, to have an explosion. This, is, this agrees with other people in 1D that artificially explode things, they find similar percentages uh, of heating efficiency, 10 to 15%. In 1D, doing the full transport, you only get 6%, so this is why um, they don't explode in 1D. You have to, you have to artificially for high values of the C2.5, though, you find that um, the heating efficiency you need to explode starts to increase. So you need to inject more and more energy back into the material to launch an explosion. And the reason is, uh, is most clearly shown on this plot here, I think. Um, if you don't launch an explosion very early on, the mass of your proton star is approaching the maximum mass of the the equation of state. So you start to make a black hole. You have to drive an explosion very early on in the evolution to avoid a black hole. And to drive an explosion early on, you're fighting against very high accretion rates. So you have to inject more energy back into the material in order to actually get a successful explosion. So this is rolling off. Also happens around 0.45. It's rolling off of a remnant mass. You can involve it with the salt Peter IMF. Um, saying that if we make the assumption that progenitors with a C2.5 more than 4.45, which is roughly this point here, or roughly roughly this intersection here between these guys and these guys, then we then we estimate that for zero metallicity stars, something like 13% will make black holes. 13% of core collapse events will result in the formation of the black. For solar metallicity stars, it's a little less because you're missing all these massive stars that have huge mass loss rates, don't form black holes. So you get less stars forming black holes, something like 4% for the latest model set. So this is the first just, if I assume the ones that do make black holes all form black holes with the mass equal to their pre supernova mass, then I can plot their mass distribution down here. It's quite high, higher than that experimental observational plot I showed you before, which is between um, the, the, the experimental one is of course all binaries because you lost yeah. most of the envelope in the binary, so yeah. you shouldn't have to worry about that. You're right. So the unfortunately every every black hole we see is in a binary. So you have that huge bias there. Oh no, no, no. Uh, and then these are all the neutron stars you form somewhere between one and a half and two solar masses. So this doesn't include fallback. You might have fallback of these guys and maybe make new black holes, but then you run into this mass gap problem that I mentioned before. So we don't see black holes between three and five. This could be solved by the same argument, the, the binary system. Okay, so my take home point is this that the uh, central engine intimately is related to the pre supernova structure which is not intimately related to the initial conditions of the star. More, moreover, it's, it depends on the 
details of Star Wars. I mean, ultimately, it's related to the initial conditions, obviously. <laughs> but it's not a very clear relationship between initial conditions and the final conditions. Okay, let's get this. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about collecting neutrino oscillations and just was a quick question before you get into the subject. Just how well do your results be with the synthetic constraints on the division between the that? I have never checked that. I would assume not bad because our numbers are so low in terms of making black holes. It's not like you lose half of the material to black holes. But I have never checked that number. Um, which I'll only come from NASA's test. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so collecting neutrino oscillations are a new phenomenon in the neutrino field. Um, so you may know of regular neutrino oscillations that just happen in, say, a vacuum. Uh, and they're governed by some vacuum Hamiltonian potential. It's because the mass, the mass eigenstates of the neutrino are different from the player eigenstates. So if you create electron neutrino, it's actually a superposition of mass eigenstates and there's a ball forward in time. You get interference and you end up with something other than electron neutrino somewhere down in the vacuum. Those are vacuum neutrinos. It's <laughs> just the evolution of uh, If you add matter in, electrons, for example, or leptons, and this is, influences the potential that the electron neutrinos see. And so it influences the Hamiltonian that the electron neutrinos see and affects the evolution of those. But again, since they're traveling, it's only, you have this, this um, complication with the mass eigenstates. And so this leads to very interesting physics. So the sun, this matters in the sun. Electron neutrinos emit in the sun. Um, when they get to Earth, depending on the energy, it could be anywhere from 30% to 60% uh, probability that they're an electron neutrino. But it could be some you know, neon neutrino or a or atomic neutrino. Depends on that. Because of this structure. Um, collective neutrino, uh, yeah, so if you have a large presence of neutrinos, a very large presence of neutrinos, then this, since neutrinos are also leptons, they can contribute to the evolution of the neutrinos themselves. So the neutrinos contribute some potential. Um, to the evolution of neutrino. It depends on the total density of neutrinos, and then basically mm -hmm. 1 over r to the 4. This is assuming the single angle and single angle approximation of a neutrino sphere, basically. If you have neutrinos being emitted from a neutrino sphere, uh, this is the Hamiltonian you'll see as a function of it. So when the neutrino density is high, they'll have this high potential, and it'll affect their evolution. That's off the uh, quite a complicated calculation because unlike these first two terms, now it becomes nonlinear because it depends on the fields themselves. Um, and it also couples the neutrinos to the antineutrinos. So uh, Basri Vizcunta at, uh, at Ohio State um, is an expert in collective neutrino oscillations. So he has worked with us on, on this study in the term. Um, this is an example of what happens if you start with two spectra of neutrinos. So the blue is electron neutrinos, and the red is uh, a heavy type of neutrino, so we want to pass for a superposition. Right? These are the, the electron, uh, the, the antis on the other side. What you get is these uh, neutrino spectra evolve in radius, in interacting via this potential I showed you on the previous page, is the spectra undergo a complete swap. This is in the inverted hierarchy with these numbers. So you end up having your electron neutrinos completely switch, almost completely switch to the new X neutrinos, and vice versa. And this is potentially very interesting, and Dick already mentioned this. Uh, the new X neutrinos, which were the, the, originally the red curve, have a higher mean squared energy than the electron neutrinos. So they have more energy at higher energies. And this increases the charge current cost which goes as roughly the energy squared. And 
And so imagine a situation where you replace this guy, the mean squared energy of the electron neutrinos, with the mean squared energy of the Huggy neutrinos. This can increase your heating rate by something like a factor of two, Na naturally, not in a fudgy way. Um, and potentially increase this uh, red region and the possibility of expulsion. So, so in this, uh, we, uh, the transport through the electron medium is pretty well defined. But um, it is the actual uh, passage through the, uh, is there a feedback, for example, in the neutrino collective oscillation with the neutrino cells? Is that a big deal? Uh, it's, uh, personally, yes, it's a very big deal. The state of the field is that it's, it's completely unknown how to deal with it. But why not? I mean, it's a very straightforward distribution function if we can break down. Um, be because the, so typically for a collective neutrino oscillations, like a multi-angle calculation, uh, you need like thousands of energy bins and thousands of angular bins in spherical symmetry. But why is it more complicated than, let's say, neutrino neutrino okay, neutrino neutrino scattering? Um, it also has a distribution function for the core that's very um, Less severe than this. <coughs> signal you see on Earth, 
these things still matter. If they still oscillate outside the shock, obviously you need to know what they oscillate into so you know what to look for on there. Um, but in terms of uh, affecting the central engine, it seems like they don't do that. So how would your low M and X and M would be the current experimental? I think they're 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 typical. But this maybe is too small. I don't know. I always forget whether it's squared or not. So. Um, but these don't these don't matter much because you're you're um, because uh, the neutrino potential is so high. I think it matters that they're known zero, but it doesn't really matter what the value is. You're still going to see it. It matters what the sign is. This what I'm what I'm saying here. If it's the regular normal hierarchy, you don't see this at all. It's something that's unique to the hierarchy because the because you have more electron neutrinos than than you. Okay, so in the last two minutes, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about previous, so this is kind of like an envelope to where the future is going for um, core cloud supernova simulations. This is a study by Nordvex et al. 2010. Did simulations in one, two, and three D three dimensions, and plot plot here the luminosity, the neutrino luminosity they need to dial in in order to get an explosion versus the accretion rate at the time of the explosion. So they find that as you go to 3D, it becomes, in a, in a sense, easier to explode because you need a smaller neutrino. This is not exactly analogous to what we do when, when I explode a star, but basically the fudge factor they need to multiply their heating by is less. Is there an intuitive explanation of what that is? Um, so, so the idea that most people say is in in 2D you have more degrees of freedom. So your when your elements come into the shock, they can move around or not regularly, and so they stay in the heating region longer. So basically, your heating region gets bigger in mass. You have more material that you're actually heating, and so your neutrino mechanism becomes more efficient. That also gets wider too. Yeah. 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 So stay there longer. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's yeah. There's a feedback on the test people. Yeah. Um, so the production group has done similar simulations. They tried to match these as best they could, including the colors of the lines. Uh, they see when they, they see when they go to 3D that they don't see no significant enhancement over the 2D simulations. Well, they do see an enhancement from the 1D simulations. So this is these are both pretty recent works. It's unclear which, if either, uh, was accurate. Yeah. So these, yeah, these do not. I mean, these are the left was just light bulb parts. Yeah. So is this. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Um, so they like tried to match these. Correct. Pardon me. What approximation was that? Light bulb. The light bulb approximation was it? So. Um, that would be the luminosity. Yeah, so they're, they they write down a cooling rate, which goes as like t to the 6. Then they write down a heating rate, which is basically equal to some luminosity they pick. Even if it's completely, if it's five times higher than the actual luminosity of the simulation, they don't really care. Uh, they take that luminosity and do charge current heating with it and, and cut it off with the some optical depth at higher higher this. So what is the state of the gas that we have like say the heating rate? Is it uh higher than In three D, yeah. Or is it in all the so uh is it is um can you do something similar like a that is possibly and uh can you turn on your design do a different one D and three D? So there's people that uh have, have thought about doing this. So, uh, Jeremiah Murphy and Casey Meekin have had a paper recently on, on looking at characteristics in 3D and trying to write some, the same thing they mixed in on theory is. Yeah, yeah. Well, the build-up of vorticity in 2D is you intense down flames. 
that downflows, very concentrated downflows, which aren't present mm -hmm. in the tree. Oh, they are. No, it's much more distributed. Yes. Which is smoothie? But just the, the garden type that will be introduced in the tree is at some finite optical depth, right? And then all the things up. For those, uh, for that particular simulation, no. No? So they, they had another 3D paper recently. When they did, where they did that. They didn't have the cut of the permit from Star. But this is, they tried to reproduce their simulation. The, the I see, they tried, they tried to use this exactly the same, yeah. which were a bit opaque, of course. But, uh, yeah, and it, yes. And even the things that were clearly obvious, they didn't match up. But, um, so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so here you'll see some 3D fluid motions compared to, not compared to 2D, but which are significantly different than you'd see in 2D. Uh, so this is the, uh, the color map is the electron fraction, so the amount of electrons, number of electrons per nucleon. And it starts off, started off um, in the class phase, and it drops nuclear densities um, and starts to delapse. So material coming in the shock, it's flowing down like this. It comes in the shock uh, and starts to delaptonize because it's emitting neutrinos. So this is a 3D simulation that uses the same neutrino leakage I've described before uh, in our one So it gets delaptonized as it comes in the shock, comes down to this, uh, something that's around, that around 50 kilometers um, is a very strongly delaptonized region. So look for electron fractions like 0.1. Is this constant in dark? I know this is a 12-solar mass model. Is, um, this is a model yeah. Yeah. And the shock's at something like 150 kilometers. This is only 100 milliseconds. It's still running. Um, uh, and it includes just neutrino leakage and not full transport. What's the distribution? Not even that. Uh, yeah, just basically we um, we do kind of a, we do leakage on rays. So we take a ray. Uh, you know, do spherically symmetric leakage along that way, um, and then the amount of energy we extract it depends on that. Um, so the leakage is like for the yeah. So for the core, yeah, there's some diffusion time scale. But you can you leak along, it? along a, a trajectory, how do you leak? It's leaked to infinity. Yeah. But you oh, you mean it's like a skin probability? Yeah. Oh, but, but you leak from that different rates and different depths and ports to the other depth. Yeah, depends on the rate now. Yeah. So we do we do hundreds of rates. Yeah. But you're grabbing something from the Pardon me? You're grabbing energy from the neutrino For the yeah, so then on top of the leakage we do heating. Which which depends on like if you integrate that with radial, you'll get some luminosity. And then we heat this proportional to that luminosity yeah. with charge growth, just like we do in the in the in one D. It's a little more difficult to prove this. Yeah, so the leakage plus the heating, the heating is added on top. But it, it, as opposed to the light bulb mechanism, the heating actually depends on the enclosed luminosity and not some luminosity you pick. So when the thing is, when you start to when you start to explode, your luminosity decreases because you're turning off accretion. But these light bulb methods, it just stays constantly on. So the, the explosions you get using light bulbs you basically like accelerate the explosion tremendously. Whereas here, as soon as you turn off accretion, your luminosity drops, your heating rate drops. Um, so it's a little more self. Which gives you more time for what the explosion is actually. Um. Yeah. I, yeah, which we've not yet seen since they're only 100 kilometers. How long did it take you to run this this point? This so this is a full 3D. So you can also do like octant mode. Um, but how long did it take you? This one is maybe 10 milliseconds a day on 300 cores. That's no, not that bad. Um, it's in 10 days. It's 10 days. That's really painful. Uh, Plus, plus time. So could you just remind me what exactly is in the simulation? It's, it's, it's full, this one's full GR. Full it's GR. A, a finite temperature equation of state. Um, and it has this nutrient. 
risk everything except the neutrino physics to stay on top. Yeah. And that's the physics that I've ever talked to. Better than stay on top. Um, well, that, of course, state of the art 3D is not very state of the art. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we could just is state of the art in any, in any way. But we're, we're working on a transport that hopefully will be easily, easily implementable in 3D. Um, in the 3D, you don't need to know what to do this. Um, it's AMR. Uh, probably. <laughs> You, probably what you see here, there's probably 200 by 200 by 200. And then AOM on the screen. What's the, the, the time limiting physical process in this? Um, is the hydro itself? Or? Yeah. Um, the sound speed's very high. So, yeah. The, just the time. But presumably, you're trying to do the recapture that last before. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm wrong. Right. Just you, since you said it's full GR rendered, that actually matter, or that sort of that, that doesn't seem like the most important thing. I think the uh, the hydro is more expensive than the GR. Yeah. The neutrino is so the hydro has three variables over there. Um, maybe I, maybe that's not the maybe it isn't the hydro. It's more expensive. I don't know. I'll have to double check that. We all take that back. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah. That's so that's everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is, I, I, I said all this. Thank you very much. So we try, we even tried to pick so the, the, the um, uh, so there's something else which I haven't mentioned, but there's matter effects as well. So when you have high enough electron densities, this can suppress collective neutron oscillations. So the level that I showed in that plot, so basically around the same radius, the oscillations are suppressed due to matter effects. So another another uh, when you go to that was an 11 solar mass model. When you go to higher solar mass models, or models with basically larger C2.5 with larger accretion rates, then they're going to be suppressed even more because the electron densities are much higher. And so these electron densities will suppress the collective oscillations to even larger radiuses. And potentially even if, out to the point where um, the only thing you, you collect the nutrient, the neutrino density has dropped so much that it's not relevant anymore because it's dropping this part of the board. So I'm sure there's some models where they're completely, and there's a recent paper that says we're just completely ignoring it. We just treat the MSW effect in terms of the things. What's your opinion of quantum computers? Uh, neutron fingers. The, these are um, things that come down. There's a double piece of instability below the shock that Wilson and the is where the motion nudge up the neutrino mass. Right, the yeah. Right value. I, I don't know. I mean, look at the physics of that one. <laughs> there could still be some quite a not one going on now. Um, I got heckled by Colgate once by one of these old, um, one of these old mechanisms. He brought it up in one of my talks saying, he I saw this problem. <laughs> well, this one was from 95, but I saw this solved the problem uh, 15 years ago. So it was well, the all stuff. Oh. In the first sudden injection in the bubble. Yeah. Hot, hot, hot. You didn't reference this paper, that's what it's going to be. So, I think we need a discussion downstairs. Thank you, love again.